You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Yeah, he was, he was a, you know, a absolutely weird sort of case, really, because he, he'd break into these houses where mostly women, but some men, and all elderly, all very, very much um, those that lived alone and, you know, been in the house for a long time. And they must have felt, you know, so secure in their own bed at night. And, and uh, he would break in, he'd remove the light bulbs or turn the electricity off so they couldn't put a light on. He'd hide their phones so they couldn't call for help. And they'd be woken up by this dark figure looming over them, shining a torch in their face. The guy who was refused admission set light to the place, 11 people died. Uh, it was back in, I think it was 94. And uh, yeah, it all 11 post mortems in one day. That was, a, that was a bizarre day. You know, you just, it was, it was just such a. Um, and that deals with the, the Levi Belford investigation. So that was, you know, Levi Belford was this horrible serial murderer and paedophile who um, is the only man ever to be given whole life sentences at two different trials in, in the country. Um, he killed two young women in South London, tried to kill another one. That was my case. And of course, he'd also killed Millie Dowler, which is, uh, was the same. How do you deal with that then at the start? Like when you get put forward to then try and catch one of the biggest serial killers on the loose at that time? The first reaction is, am I up to it? I'm not going to lie. That was, you know, that's how I felt. In what way? Well, I know this is going to be really high pressure. You know, when you watch, you know, when you read a book or you you, you, you watch a, a film or whatever, there's always this pressure, isn't there, on the, on the detectives. Can they catch him before he strikes again? You know, that that's what, it's so common. I was living that for real. That was going to be my life, you know. I was actually literally on me was going to be that pressure. If we don't catch him, how many more is he going to kill? Boom, we're on. In today's guest, we've got former detective Colin Sutton. How are you, Colin? I'm very good, thanks, James. Nice to be here. Yeah, great to see you. Very fascinating stories. You've wrote a couple of books as well. Um, but one of your biggest cases, your last case, I think, um, before you were retired, you were called in to try and find the UK's biggest sex predator. He was nearly at large for 20 years. He was breaking into old folks' houses at 17 and 18. He was raping them and doing some dark shit, male and female, that, and thankfully that you came on the scene and eventually caught him. But first of all, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm very good. I mean, it's been a bit of a manic few days with a you know, book coming out and then the drama mm -hmm. series coming out on telly. And uh, my phone's been a bit hot, but yeah, it's been, um, you know, it's been good. It's been good. It's Both the book and the, and the TV series seems to have been really well received so you know i'm really pleased yeah that's a great thing man especially giving it more publicity as well that like some of these times these sick crimes don't get mentioned enough that like mm. this guy was it delroy grant yeah delroy grant that's him yeah. was on the run for nearly 20 years like raping old women and men and yeah. breaking out of their homes like yeah he was he was a you know a absolutely weird sort of case really because he he'd break into these houses where mostly women but some men and all elderly all very, very much um, those that lived alone and, you know, been in the house for a long time. And they must have felt, you know, so secure in their own bed at night. And and uh, he would break in, he'd remove the light bulbs or turn the electricity off so they couldn't put a light on. He'd hide their phones so they couldn't call for help. And they'd be woken up by this dark figure looming over them, shining a torch in their face. He was in control. And I think he liked that part of it, you know, and... He'd talk to them sometimes for hours and and occasionally he would rape them. Quite often he would indecently assault them uh, and then steal virtually nothing, you know, steal 20 quid or a few, bit, few bits of jewellery or something like that. It wasn't, I don't think he was in it for the money. You know, he wasn't in it to make a profit. He, I think he really got off on the, the thought of being able to go in there and do that to other people. He's just a, you know, unique, I hope, individual. Yeah, power trip kind of control yeah. freak. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some sick shit that. But yeah. you've got some other fascinating cases, Colin, which we'll touch on later in the interview. But I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, well, I grew up in in, in Enfield in North London. Um, 
and my father was a police officer. Uh, he was a traffic cop, actually, PC, and I went to school in, in North London. Um, normal sort of things as a kid, you know, played football badly. No, I didn't play too badly, actually. Um, you know, I played for the local sort of representative side and things like that. Did okay at school, went to university, but from about 12 or 13, I'd really wanted to be a, a, a police officer. And uh, so I started off um, during the Met and started off as a PC at Tottenham uh, in North London in 1981, which was a, an interesting place. It was, it was, you know, I think in those days, the, the suburbs of London were a lot quieter and a lot more sort of genteel in some ways. And London was just sort of spread out into them now. So just six miles, seven miles down the road from where I lived in Enfield, Tottenham was a very different place, you know, in, in 1981. Yeah, of a culture shock, really. It was very busy. There was a, a lot of crime. There was a lot of um, public order stuff to do at Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, you know, and things like that. So I, I kind of got a good grounding in policing, I guess. It was, a, you know, it was the sort of place you either go to sink or swim. And I think, fortunately, I swam yeah. just about. How did people treat you if your dad had been a police officer? Yeah, it was good, really, in some ways, because I'd, I'd kind of grown up with seeing him and his colleagues and his friends and so kind of grown up within that environment and you know there were a lot of people uh there when i joined that knew knew my dad and knew who i was and uh so yeah it kind of i guess it prob probably helped me that i knew quite a bit about the, the kind of culture and what it was like before I, before i went in yeah so it was yeah. just an ingrained in you straight away that you wanted to kind of fight crime yeah i think so. I mean, when i joined you know i never I never dreamt of being a detective. I didn't. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, probably didn't want to do what Dad did in traffic because I'd have had to have ridden a motorbike and it scared me stiff. But uh, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And it was only really when I did a few um, few years, a few months working and got involved in investigating some crimes, I I kind of realised that I liked doing that and I liked the almost the mental challenge. You know, I'm the sort of guy who does the crossword in the paper. And, goes to quiz nights in the pub and things like that. It's just a sort of a mental challenge, I suppose. And uh, that's that's kind of how I lent that way and got, went, went down that path. What age did you join the force? I was 21. Was that was there an age limit then? Was it 21 you had to be to join? No, you had to be 18, 18 and a half. But mm -hmm. I, I said I'd, I'd, I'd been off to university where I didn't, <laughs> I didn't actually finish. I went to Leeds to read law and I hated being away from London, hated being away. I think I was too young, too mature. If gap years had been a thing then, I'd probably have carried on and done it and we wouldn't be mm -hmm. sitting here, you know. Um, but of course, it's quite ironic. I gave up after a, a year and a term and uh, joined the police. And just four or five years later, the police sort of said, oh, you haven't got a degree. And uh, they sent me back and I went full time to University College London. And I did my law degree there. While you in the police force? Yeah, while I was in the police, yeah. How did you manage that then? They just wrote me off duties. So I was just doing it full time, like I was a student. Oh, that's good, man. Yeah. Why uh, did they do that? There was a scheme they used to have. I think it was a, you know, it was a hangover then from the days when far fewer people went to university anyway. And and I'd got onto this sort of accelerated promotion scheme. And um, every year they ran this scheme, and they had six places for people to apply to go and do a scholarship at university. The course I happened to be on, there were only five of us who didn't have degrees. So we all applied and we all got it. Mm -hmm. And I think as time moved on and education changed and more and more people were getting degrees, they, they, they abandoned the scheme. Why did you not stick to it? Why did you go straight back to police officer? Oh, because by that time I had about five years service, six years service in police and uh, I knew it was the career for me. It's what I wanted to do. Is there a buzz doing it as well? Even though you must see a lot of dark, scary stuff like is it a buzz to then try to catch people because yeah. everybody's different i've had a few police officers on but everybody them kind of they yeah. get it for the right reasons but then as time goes on every, all the reasons change does it changes a person at the start yeah i think there's something in that i think there's no doubt that being a being a police officer changed me as a person but i think it changed me for the better i think it made me you know my my, my son's currently serving not very far away from where we're sitting mm -hmm. and uh, you know when he joined I said to him you know that I hoped that he would mature as a person in the same way as I think I did as a result of being in the place. Mm -hmm. So what was it like then getting your first uh, case or catching your first criminal? Oh I remember the very first person I ever arrested it was uh, an Irish lady called Mary Kelly who 
were arrested for being drunk and disorderly in Tottenham. Um, it's funny, I think most cops will always remember the name and the circumstances of the first person they arrested. Um, but I had this, this kind of strange career where, where because I was on this promotion scheme, I couldn't really be, couldn't do the normal path towards becoming a senior investigating officer. So I never did the role of DC or DS. I was, I was in uniform until I was an inspector. Um, so it wasn't really until I was a, was a DI and I'd had, a, I had about 11 years service, I think, by then, that, um, that I got involved in, in being you know, the deputy on a, on a murder and doing serious crime. But I kind of, I mean, there's a story in, in my first book that I, I, I relate, and I relate it again now. It was, I was, back in 1983, I was a uniform constable at Tottenham. We'd been on doing some overtime and a friend and I stopped off at a party that I knew was going on in Enfield. And as we were driving home, we saw this shop that was on fire. And there was no mobile phone, so Andy, Andy Taylor, who was with me, ran down to, to find a phone box and I managed to get through a shop, or through a restaurant that still had people there and get to the back of this shop and go in through the fire escape and, and just got confronted with this place that's completely ablaze. It was a, like a haberdasher's and sold neck curtains. You imagine how they went up, you know. Uh, but, of course, there was a flat at the very top and there were two people in there that ran the shop and they died. So it was a, a murder. It was obviously an arson. It was a murder investigation. And I felt really bad about it for, for a bit because I thought, oh, could I have, could I have done more, you know, I was just dressed like I am now and, and uh, you know, I had no protection at all. And if I'd have gone in there, I think I'd have ended up dying with them, mm -hmm. to be quite honest. But uh, the, the, the powers that be in the police, sort of, I think, recognised this. And, and I had to go down and make a statement about what I'd done and what we'd seen. And the guy who was the SIO sort of said, I've squared it. You can st stick around and work with the team for a few weeks. You know, it might make you feel you're doing something towards what went on. And, and I'd never been into a murder room before and a murder team room. And, and when they sit down and have these briefings and, and the, the SIO sits there at the sort of head of the horseshoe and all the team are recounting what they've been up to. And, and he's kind of keeps, keeps this mantra going almost, what have you done? What do we know? What does it mean? What do we do next? And it was kind of like that. And he's writing away in his book. And there was, it was that sort of moment like the kid that sees the, sees the fireman ringing the bell on the fire engine. I thought, wow, that's, that's just such a job. I'd love, oh, one day I can do that. I could do that. I'd love to do that job. And of course, it took a few years and I got to do it. But so once I got it, I wouldn't let go of it. Mm. Mm. What's it like seeing trauma for the first time? Did you see much as a kid before you joined the police force? No, not, not, not at all. No, I mean, it, it's... Um, so how is that? Is that difficult? Because that, I've spoke to a few police officers and they'll tend to see a lot turn to like drink and stuff. There's not enough help for police officers because of the stuff that they actually see, which is sad. But oh, yeah. how is that when you see trauma like for the first time? Is it just to kind of get on with your job or is there help there for you to, to speak for, about it? Certainly back in the 80s, it was, it was yeah, in the early 80s when I joined, it was just get on with it. You know, there's no, there's no phrase that people still use. Say, if you can't take a joke, you shouldn't join the job. And they can't say it in those circumstances when something horrible happens or something horrible happens to you or, or whatever. Um, it changed. I mean, it changed after Bullwater Farm in, in 1986. It was 85, 85, 85, yeah. Um, because shortly afterwards, in early 86, I was, I was doing a course at Hendon at Police College and uh, they had a nursing home there and they had a lot of the officers who'd been involved in Bullwater Farm Riot and... Uh, it was it was like something from Mash on the telly, you know. It was, so what it was, happened there at the riot? Well, it was a it was a an uprising, I suppose, <clears throat> in 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 against the Broadwood Farm Estate. Um, sorry, forget that bit. <laughs> Let me get the thoughts here. Broadwood Farm Estate in Tottenham was an estate built in the in, in the sixties, and um, for various reasons, it had a high concentration of sort of problem quote families as well and a high concentration of ethnic minority families and there was drug dealing there was a lot of crime around on the estate and and it was kind of the sort of place that was could be made into a fortress if you know what i mean there were sort of three entrance points and you've got these big buildings and walkways and very difficult place to police now i was a community officer there for about three or four months and, and uh, very difficult time in my service and 
by the time October 85 came, there was, you know, there was a lot of resentment about how it was being policed. And, and uh, there was a, an incident and uh, then there was a deputation after the incident. The incident was, was, was a woman died at her home, not on the estate, after a police search, during a police search. And there was a deputation went to the police station. Intention had been quite high and it turned, you know, ends up with a few things being thrown. And then it all went back to the estate and there were false calls made to police to, to call them onto the estate. And then they were attacked with bricks and bottles and petrol bombs and the whole thing just carried on for, for, for hours and, and of course during that time there was a fire engine a fire crew that were trying to put a fire out on the shops on the estate and they were given a police um series of group of police officers to try and protect them and they were all attacked and as a result of that two police officers kind of fell over as they were trying to retreat one of them keith blakelock was was murdered uh, and the other one was was seriously injured um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it was a kind of dark day in, in policing for so many reasons, but there were a lot of people there who saw things that traumatized them greatly. And I say, I, I wasn't there. Um, thankfully I, I'd been transferred to sergeant by then and I was working elsewhere, but, uh, you hung around in Hendon at that time. And there were, you know, there were a dozen or so people in the nursing home who were suffering from what we'd now recognise as PTSD. And, and I guess it's the early days of it being recognised in the police service then. Yeah. Um, and and it, it was a powerful image to see the effect that being involved in something like that can have on, the, on a human being. What was the first bit of trauma you that sticks out in your mind where you think, shit, man, that, and you probably didn't realise it then that affected you, but you look back and you think, mm. okay, that was a trigger point for something. I think the, the one that I really remember was, funnily enough, my very last day of duty at Tottenham. And uh, we, we, we had to deal with a, with a road accident where essentially, uh, because of the traffic for the football match, the, there was a car tried to do a three-point turn, Tottenham High Road, and was T-boned by uh, a, a much heavier car. It was an old Mini was the car that did the three-point turn. It was a big Rover that hit it. It was a bad accident, but the little girl who was in the back of the car, five-year-old girl, was kind of thrown out through the side window of the Mini and died. And I say it was my very last day. It was New Year, I think it was New Year's Day, you know, it was kind of a, after, a, after the holiday. And I was acting as sergeant then. I was getting promoted literally the next day. Uh, and... Uh, and going off on my course, and the, the inspector asked me to, to do various things, but deal with, with, with the family and, and, and go and see them. And uh, yeah, it was, it was the first time I'd come face to face with recently bereaved people and where that bereavement was a child. And you kind of got two things there, and it was just also senseless and so hopeless. And, and you know, so it was a bank holiday, and this little girl in the back of the car. And, they're just trying to get through the traffic to go and see their family. How do you deal with that then, Colin? Especially later, later on in your career when you're trying to kind of come away from it all and chill yeah. out a bit. Yeah, it's... There, there, there was certain... I dealt pretty well with the fact that there were things that I saw and experienced that most people don't even know about, let alone see, you know, and, and, and that there is a whole different world to the life that you and I live and you never know how other people live their lives and, and what happens in those lives so I I kind of separated that out pretty much from from the beginning and, and pretty early on and I guess I developed a thick skin and I guess that it was only the few occasions when that thick skin was pierced that were the ones that I really remember you know um and some of those, you know, I've been lucky enough to be able to to kind of share by having them dramatised in, in, in the two in the two dramas. Um, and probably a mark of how good the dramas are, that I, I felt all the same emotions when I was watching it being enacted as I did at the time. One of those in the most recent series was this, this business of this woman who was, she was actually 93 years old and 
touch when she's grasping my hand. And whispering to me, he interfered with me, you know. Um, and my head spun and I, I just, I knew that I had to carry on being professional and do what I had to do, but I just wanted to burst into tears and to hug her, you know, because it was just this lovely old lady and, and what she'd been put through. And it kind of brought it home to me that there's, you know, there are, there are still things that I can find emotional. And in some ways I'm pleased about that because if you do 30 years as a police officer and you're relatively, you know, active and, and an operation with them, you do see an awful lot of sadness and human frailty and, you know, all, all the other things. And, yeah. and it can, you know, it, it was almost reassuring to know that I was, they could still get to me. You're still human. Yeah. Because you become cold at a mash and you would bottle all that shit up to then try and move on to the next job and catch the next criminal. And that's yeah. why shows like this are so important because a lot of people from the streets have grown up to not like the police, to not cooperate, to, to yeah. hate on them. And it's if you're yeah. active and being bad, it's understandable that the police are your enemy. But it's to, under, it's to show that police officers are human. Yeah. The shit that they need to say, DN, D out, rapes, murders, yeah. suicides, overdose, a lot of bad, bad stuff. And <clears> that <throat> affects them mentally. It, affects, it scars them for life. Like people are out there trying to clean up the streets. Like, no matter in life, there's always good and bad. I always say this, but no matter who, if you're a cop or no yeah. matter if you're a, a nun or a priest, there's good and bad. Yeah, like, it's, sure. it's just yeah. life. But if yeah. you show people that we're all kind of human and, and it's kind of all under the same sky, try to fight the same battle, but it's um, to show people that what you actually have to go through to then try and survive because then you eventually have family and kids and if you're seeing bad stuff every day, it must play a massive part in your mental well-being. Yeah, absolutely. It does. It does. It's funny you talk about the kids, you know, because you, you kind of you kind of try and shield them from it a bit. And, and you know, my my kids were, were young when I was when I was investigating murders all the time. And you know, what do you do at work today, Daddy? Well, you know, I, I, it's just yeah, it's just um, you try and you try and sort of shield them from that and, and keep that separation. Um, I, listen, I, I've I think. I think I've come out of it relatively unscathed. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm 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 in a sort of a happy place. But the fact is that there are many who don't, and you know, thankfully that's 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 being recognised within the service now. And you've got I don't know, just just lots of little initiatives and things. Just a, just a phrase, you know, it's okay not to be okay. It's it's a phrase, you know. Yeah. Um. And you 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 kind of realise that actually. Quite often, all it needs is somebody to talk to, to talk to about it, you know, and just to say how you feel. And uh, but it's it's encouraging people who are in, you know, if I say a, a kind of a macho culture, that's not reducing it or is excluding it to you know to 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 men. Um, but because it's that kind of tough culture anyway within within policing, maybe it makes it even more difficult for people to say, "Do you know what this is getting to me? Do you know what?" I can't cope with this. Yeah. And they must, and they must be allowed to, and they must be able to, and they must have help mm -hmm. to get through it. Do you become more protective towards your family and kids, Colin, as yeah. time goes on, especially in the murder investigation scene when you're seeing some horrific things? Like, do you become so protective because you know how bad the world can be sometimes? Yeah, I think I think it's right. I think it's wider than that, really, James. I think you I think actually police officers are far more fearful of crime than everybody else because of what they've seen and what they know. Yeah. You know. And, and and so you, I'll be with 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 my wife or with 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 my friends who, who haven't been police officers. And, and when I sort of say, "Well, oh, let's be a bit careful here," or, or what, you know, they say, well, "What's up with you? You're paranoid about it." I said, no, "I'm not paranoid. I know what goes on. You don't. You don't understand mm -hmm. what goes on." You know. So yeah, it does. It, it does. Some would say it just makes you awfully cynical about other human beings. Perhaps it does, but it it, it kind of yeah. You you know things. Or appreciate things that others don't, and they're probably better off for not knowing it, yeah. not appreciating it. You know, but. how hard is it to see the beautiful things in life? That like, there's so much goodness and so many beautiful things, but how hard is it when you're constantly seeing negatives? Like I had a man just on before you called Daniel Cross, who mm. great man who used when you watch the news, you see horrific crimes and things happening, and you never think that will never happen to me. But he was on the phone; his, his house was getting burgled. 
His wife phoned him and says, look, I think there's somebody trying to get in. The guy got in while he was still on the phone. He was working away and he heard his wife get murdered. The guy tried to kill the kids also, but the wife protected the kids, but she ended up getting killed in the, in the crossfire. And then they tried to take the kids away, but thankfully the police were there in time. And um, he's, he's like, ah, fuck me. That, that can really knock somebody... But that man never let that defeat him. Because I know people, childhood trauma is a big thing. The kid at six, his son seen that trauma. Mm. And so he's still affected by it six years course, later. Yeah. And, and it's understandable. But yeah. um, Dan himself has now opened up a strongman uh, mental health thing that yeah. he pushed through and try to understand that you can kick on in life. Bad things do happen. But it's just crazy that when you actually speak to people, you realise, fuck me, that like, some people are so... Um, blinded by actually some of the serious stuff that goes on, mm. which you would have probably seen. That like, and then in the inve- murder investigation, like how many murders did you get called out to? Oh, called out to. I really don't know the number because we'd also also this sort of on call stuff. Like, yeah. Once a week, where we'd kind of start it off and then hand it out to somebody else. But I think I was responsible for thirty nine as senior investigating officer over the years. Um, but you, do you know sometimes? I mean. What you're saying about that man, I mean, he sounds absolutely remarkable. How, how can you, mm-hmm. you know, how can you, how can you even start to understand what he's been through? Um, but but occasionally, what does what does make you realise that there's, there's there's still hope for humanity? Sometimes yeah. is that out of something as tragic and as awful as that, some good can come. And you know, he's he's used channeled the. All the anger and maybe bitterness and sorrow and grief that he had, and obviously would have had about it, and, and challenged that, mm-hmm. challenged that, sorry, and channeled that to to be a force for good. Uh, one of my cases that I did that we, we did a program about in the, the Sky Crime um, documentary series that I did uh, earlier in the year. There's a, a lad, eighteen year old lad called Christopher Donovan, who was essentially kicked to death in one of the most stupid and senseless murders I think I ever came across, uh, where literally he's walking with his brother and a friend and another group of young people come towards him. They're all a bit drunk, the other group. Um, they've been taking a few drugs. And there's just a silly argument. There's the two groups of kids walking along in the street, you know? And it turns into a fight and he ends up getting kicked to death. And it's just completely, completely avoidable and, and pointless. And I... Saw his parents, uh, Ray and Vi Donovan, uh, very soon afterwards when I got given the case to investigate. And they're just the most remarkable people uh, that, 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 you know, they were committed Christians, very ordinary people, but very sensible people. And they grieved, they had the sorrow, they had the bitterness, they had the anger that everybody has in those. You know, it's natural to have in those sort of circumstances. And when that trial was over and they did the thing that so many members, so many bereaved families will do and that they'll come up as if you've been some kind of saviour for them. And I always find that's the worst time because it's the time I realise there's nothing else we can do for them. We've, t- we've investigated their loved one's death. We've taken it to court. There's been a conviction. The perpetrator's going to prison. Still doesn't bring him back, does it? Still doesn't bring her back, you know, the loved one. And I can't do any more for you now. You know, well, I suppose I could do, I can do, and did with them because I've stayed in touch with them to this day. But what they did, I think, with the help of the sort of counselling they got and through their church and so forth, they formed a trust in his name to promote restorative justice and to try and divert young people away from crime. And they both got OBEs now for what they've done, their services to, to justice. And they go around to prisons, they go around to schools, they've got this charity. And none of that good would have happened if Christopher hadn't been murdered. Yeah. So, you know, and, and so that's why I try and support them as much as I can. They have sort of carol services and things at Christmas with the Met Choir and I go mm-hmm. into that. And I say, try and support them with it. So I think that's, you know, that, that's really my answer. It's a long-winded way of saying, yeah, sometimes in amongst all this mayhem and grief, something good can evolve. And it's, yeah. it's those things that make us think, actually, 
we're not all doomed. Yeah. You know? Did you have to see all the, the 39 murder cases? Did you see all dead bodies? Um, yeah, pretty much so. I think so. Certainly, yeah, I think so. Um, you, the senior investigating officer really should always go to the post-mortem examination. They're, they're obviously they're grisly um, things, and, and you know, but once you've once you've been to one or two, it kind of you, you become a bit sort of you know hardened to that as well. They take an awfully long time now. And when I started, they would take two or three hours. You can be in there now for eight, nine hours because the progress of science and the investigation of science has meant there are so many more things that can be done. And so it takes longer to mm. do. And, and uh, yeah, I once did 11 on the same day. I was, I was a BI and there was a case uh, of a fire at a unlicensed cinema in, in Smithfield in London. And the guy who was refused admission set light to the place, 11 people died. Uh, this back in, I think it was 94. And uh, yeah, did all 11 post-mortems in one day. That was a, that was a bizarre day. You know, you just, it was, it was just such a, a production line almost. We had two pathologists, two scenes of crimes officers, two photographers, Two exhibits officers, two slabs side by side, and I was sort of overseeing them. And yeah, they did six. We went and had lunch and came back and did the other five. And it's just that's mad how you can harden yourself. That, that's the sort of, yeah, well, that's the sort of day, that. James, when you get home yeah. and you think, shit, what, <laughs> what kind of a day at work was that? You yeah. know, <laughs> it's just absolutely yeah. mind blowing. But I mean, it's very unusual. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, you know, things things happen like that. We have sadly, we have the we have terrorist attacks. We have you know, tragedies, uh, disasters and things where somebody has to do all that. Somebody has, somebody's involved in sorting all that out at the end, you know. And you just go straight back into work the next day, yeah. any time, no time off, nothing. It's, it is mm. mad like that. If I see ants on the road, I'll step over them because I don't want to hurt them. Never yeah. mind going into yeah. work and seeing a loving bodies burnt yeah. to the ground. Like, it just shows you, like I say, for people watching this to understand that what police officers have to go through to then and firemen and firemen Fire and firefighters yeah, doctors as well doctors, nurses, nurses got to see all that shit like. ambulance yeah but I'd imagine it would make you so cold that <clears throat> it's, it'd be difficult to adapt to normal life because that's not normal things you see you see people in the army as well seeing that yeah terrible shit like, and yeah. the majority of people are homeless are ex-military and because as human beings we shouldn't be seeing darkness like that but mm. like you says there that it happens and somebody's got to be there at the forefront to do it yeah so when yeah. you started moving through the ranks then, Colin, because you you became very at the top of your craft, like, how did you keep getting promoted just because of the work and no, it was you put I, in? I was on this sort of scheme. So so um, essentially, if you came, how it worked back then was you could take the sergeant's exam for promotion if you had two years service when you'd done your probation, and I took my I was encouraged by my my then chief superintendent to take it. At the very first opportunity, which was, I had two years and three days service, and I took it. And if you passed in the top one hundred, I think, in in the Met at the time, you were then given an interview to go on this accelerated promotion scheme. Well, I came twenty seventh, I think, so I was quite high, and uh, got on that. Went on the interview, got through that, and then had to go to one of these three day extended interviews um, up in Lancashire, actually, where you had to do all sorts of exercises and things over three days and write stuff and you're interviewed and and uh, I got through it and I got selected for this course and it meant that in um January 1984 as I say the day after that fatal road accident I talked about I was off down to Bramshill which was then the police college in Hampshire to do a year there on what they called the, the special course as a sergeant and uh, that was sort of half and half um law and procedure and half and half uh sort of management and, and leadership training. It was, a, you know, it's a big Jacobean mansion in 270-odd acres of Hampshire countryside. It was just a wonderful place to live for a year. I was the youngest in the course. I was, I was only 23 when I went down there. And, uh, yeah, I made some friends for life there from people who were on other course, uh, from other forces and, and, and from the Met. And uh, they looked after me because I was the baby, um, particularly a couple of ex-military Guys on there, we're both ex-Marines who, who who I became friendly with and sort of took care of me. I had a wonderful time. I mean, I was I, I played 
it's like the university you have Wednesdays with sports day mm-hmm. and they had a football team they had a cricket team so I played in both of those and and, and uh, had a great time and passed passed the course at the end and that meant I came out as a sergeant and I only had to do one year as a sergeant in uniform and because we'd taken the inspector's exam while we were down there we were qualified for inspector if we did a satisfactory year as a sergeant we were inspector how many ranks is there in the police force? Oh God, don't ask me. There's eight as or nine. Yeah, as a, hey, yeah. So the first one is a beat. That's just yeah, yeah. Constable starts off, then you go to sergeant, and then inspector. Um, so I was a uniform inspector in December 1985, having joined in January 1981. I had I had like four years, eleven months service. I was 25 years of, of age, mm-hmm. and I was in charge of a whole response team at Leighton in, in in East London. What's the top one? Oh, the commissioner's the top one. Is that? Yeah, the Met. You see, the reason I, I, the Met has other levels as you mm-hmm. get really high up that county forces don't have. But you know, I, I mean, it's very, it's very bottom heavy. The rank structure. There are only a very few at the very top, and then it gets down it. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I achieved the middle ranking role of chief inspector, detective chief inspector. Um, you know, only a smallish percentage of all police officers ever attain that rank or higher. So. But it wasn't for me about necessarily having the, you know, the best rank I could or the, the best. So I, I always counted myself. I still count myself really lucky that I spent thirty years doing a job where I loved going to work mm. every day. And so few people can say that. Other than podcast hosts, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's true, bro. but but you know, but it is. It's, it's right though, isn't it? You know, if, if you, I don't know where you're from, but you know where, where I came from. The the the. Um, there were factories nearby and you'd mm-hmm. see when I was a kid, you'd see all these men, mostly men actually, but some women obviously as well, but cycling to and from the factories. They had these big yellow plastic capes they used to put over their bikes because mm-hmm. they could and they're going to a factory every day. In other parts of the country you've got people going down coal mines every day. And I've been down a coal mine, a proper coal mine up in Yorkshire in the nineties. And I have to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, those guys who did that pay them whatever they were asking for, you know, because there is no way on earth I could do that every day for a while. Yeah, life. tough old job. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, there's so many people who 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 have to work, mm-hmm. are motivated to work, No, you know, decent enough people. I'm not going to rely on the state. I'm not going to rely on handouts. I'm not going to try to turn a crime. I'll do this job even though I hate it because I want to provide for myself and my family. And they do that, and there are lots of people who do that. And I was lucky enough to be doing something I could do that, and I loved every minute of it. Yeah. So you know, um, that was always my my kind of motivation. Really, was 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 to enjoy what I was doing. And when I started being a senior investigating officer, it was just the best job in the world. I just loved loved doing mm-hmm. it, which is probably why I did it for so long. Yeah. What about um, your books? How many books have you got out, Colin? I've got. <clears throat> excuse me. I've got two out. Then one mm-hmm. one. Both of them came out to coincide with the Manhunt, Martin Clunes TV dramas because they, they were the books upon which they were based. So one's been out since um, 2019. It's just called Manhunt. And uh, that's um, not a title I particularly wanted, but ITV forced it on us. And it's mm-hmm. made no sense to make the uh, the book and the TV under a different title. Mm-hmm. Um, and that deals with the, the Levi Belford investigation. So that was, you know, Levi Belford was this horrible serial murderer and paedophile who um, is the only man ever to be given whole life sentences at two different trials in, in, in the country. Um, he killed two young women in South London, tried to kill another one, that was my case, and then of course he'd also killed Millie Dowler, which is, uh, was the Surrey case, and he, he got mixed of that as well. So that's the book about that one, the first book. And then the next book is is about uh, the Derek Grant investigation that we mentioned at the start, where, mm. where, where was was something after after Belfield and um, before I retired, I was just asked to go and sort of do a review, really, for a couple of weeks, and probably made the mistake of coming up with an idea that somebody liked and, and got the gig, as it were. And, and uh, you know, I'm glad I did because we succeeded, and, and we took him off and, and stopped these old people from being terrorised in their own home yeah. you know? so you, it's difficult to to not think that you know you've done some good by doing that so they're, they're the two books I've got another one that I'm contracted to write but I'm not quite sure when that's going to be finished because mm-hmm. the story hasn't really finished yet um, and that's about some murders that happened in London during the 1970s um, that I did 
some review work on when I was in the police, but kind of we all got on the back burner. Yeah. But, uh, it's a fascinating story. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty. They're, they're they're both out. Manhunt, Manhattan, the Night Stalker. Yeah. They're all on Amazon. Normal places. We'll leave links in the description because. Yeah. Why do you think that true crime sales? Why is that such a turn on for people? Like you go into Netflix, you go into it's all mur- murders, it's all serial yeah. killers. Like yeah. why is it so a, much a, a attraction for human beings? Well, I think it touches on what we talked about earlier on, James. I think it's it's kind of the fact that it's so removed and so different to other people's lives. And by reading about it, seeing about it on television, hearing about it on podcast, they can kind of try to understand and try to imagine what it's like being involved in in in, in that and you know and how how it is for both the victims and i guess for the perpetrators and, and for the detectives as well it's but you're right there's i mean there's an apparently inexhaustible sort of demand for it yeah. at, at the moment both here and, and, and abroad and and uh yeah I, um it's interesting watching the i mean the audience reaction to to manhunt and night stalker over the last few days it has been amazing i, mean, I, I know I know Twitter's Twitter's not the world, is it? Thankfully, but but um, <laughs> but it's a window to the world or yeah, a window to yeah. some of the world. Um, <laughs> and, and and you know the, the, the reaction. I'm told. Now I don't I don't crunch the numbers and things like this, but I'm told that um, the tweets about the third episode, which was the night before last, third episode of Manhunter Two, exceeded the number of tweets for the not only the first two episodes. But also the whole of the previous series, all put together. together. Yeah, um, so, and 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 you know, I've been sitting there. My wife and I've been sitting there, sort of scanning it and, and going through it, and, and trying to reply to people that ask reasonable sort of questions. You know? mm-hmm. But what actually stands out is the number of negative things, negative tweets out of the literally thousands and thousands of times we've seen. You know, it's three or four. It's it's. Uh, I'm blown away by the audience reaction to it because. There were no car chases, no fights, no, um, yeah. no, no gun gunshots, mm-hmm. and you know I wasn't an alcoholic who was having affairs. It was it was kind of it's none of the sort of tropes and the normal sort mm-hmm. of fictional detective stuff. But it was just about what it's like for these detectives who are, you know, they're ordinary men and women who just do a particular yeah. job, and it's what it's like to be in their shoes to go through to mm-hmm. go through that. And that's what I've tried to do with the books is giving yeah. from from the point of view of this is. I, I, I wouldn't. I don't want to write a book about Levi Belfield or Delroy Grant. I don't want to see them on the television. I don't. You know, they're they're they're, they're worthless. Mm. But the people who did the work to put them in prison to stop them, they're worth a million of them. Yeah, and that's who I wanted to write. So the first book, because you've worked in that's near enough two of the biggest cases in the UK that like are mega cases like to be involved in them but mm. the first one the serial killing one at Belf- is it Belford? Belford yeah like, how do you deal with that How what's the game plan when you see young girls getting uh, brutally murdered was it four yeah and then how do you well three three in an attempt yeah, convicted yeah. Girl, yeah. So how yeah. do you deal with that then at the start like when you get put forward to then try and catch one of the biggest serial killers on the loose at that time the first reaction is, am I up to it? I'm not going to lie. That was, you know, that's how I felt. In what way? Well, I know this is going to be really high pressure. You know, when you watch, you know, when you read a book or you you you, you watch a, a film or whatever, there's always this pressure, isn't there, on the on the detectives? Can they catch him before he strikes again? You know, that that's what is so common. I was living that for real. That was going to be my life. You know, I was actually literally on me was going to be that pressure if we don't catch him. How many more is he going to kill? And that's a big old responsibility to take on. Uh, and and I think I think if anybody said they would never have the you know the slightest doubt they were up to it, then I, I think they'd probably be probably <clears throat> telling lies. I think everybody would ask themselves. Mm-hmm. And you kind of think, well, I'm trained for it. I've done the courses. And there's yeah, a funny thing about investigating serial mm-hmm. crimes like this. There are only a few. Detectives get trained as senior investigating officers, full stop. Only a few of those get trained to do these serial cases. And only a very few of those actually get to do one live, because thankfully there aren't that many of them. So when it comes, it lands in your lap, you you yeah, you sort of think, well, would there be anybody else who's better? You know, I really did. 
But I kept thinking, well, someone, someone's got to step up. Someone's got to do it. Someone's got to take that, take that risk of feeling that you'd failed on something really important. You know, that, that's, that's, that's the, the, the risk, isn't it? Is that, you know, if I don't do a good job, mm. if somehow we don't, somehow we mess it up, other people might well be dying. And that's that's a huge thing to bear. So that's an under, another bit of pressure. So if you, mm. when you're on a case like that and then he mm. strikes again and somebody gets yeah. murdered, how do you feel with that? Does that totally deflate you and thinking more pressure that? Mm. Well, well for you feel that like failure that it, time. It didn't. It didn't happen. But but with with Belfield because before he struck him, we did arrest him. But mm-hmm. although it took a long time to to get the evidence and to convict him, he was at least arrested and on remand, so he couldn't do any harm. Um. Oh God, I, I, I think it would be devastating to me personally. I, I, I really, I really don't know how, how you, would, how I would go on and, and cope living with that every day. That I would mess something up and somebody had died as a result. You know, and it's, uh, I say, just fortunately it didn't happen. But, but until he was locked away, that was. That was a reality, you know. That was the reality that you were facing. That, and and, and it wasn't just me, you know. There's this team. You see, all I often say this: most of the team, most of these detectives on these murder squads are very experienced, very talented, highly trained officers. And actually, the difference between them and me is I get paid just a little bit more for signing the pieces of paper at the end of the day and and making decisions, you know. Um, so they, you know, they would have, they would have felt the same, I'm sure. And in cases where it's happened, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how those officers must feel, but it, yeah, it, it would it, it'd be a weighty thing to have on your mind, wouldn't it? What was the what was his motive for these killings? Well, we don't really know. Um, he, he he's such a narcissistic, self centered person. He kind of just did whatever he pleased all the time, and it didn't matter what effect that had on another person. It didn't matter what effect that had on. The legality of what he was doing, he he was just a you know just did what he wanted, and all that mattered to him was him. Um, what we were able to work out from the Emily Delagrange murder was that she was walking along the road, and because we had so many CCTV sightings of Belfield in his van, we worked out that at one point he must have driven past her, and because it then took her longer to get from the point we last saw her before he went past her to the point where we last saw her. I'll explain this very well. But basically, she died to slow down or she'd stopped for a time. And that was the time when the van was near her. So we think, knowing what he's like and what people have told us about him, we think he was cruising around looking for a woman, a young woman, not necessarily to murder, but to chat up and take her in his car, maybe drug and rape, because he did do that as well. Um, and when she said no in that exchange at the side of the road, he let her go and then followed her, got out of the car and bashed her on the head. What sort of stuff was he doing to the woman? That was it. That was all he did. That's all he would do with, with these blitz attacks. And, it, and he carried out a number of them um, because apart from the two that died and the one that nearly died, there's at least another two that we know of that survived. Um, he, he would just, we think, the best guess we can say, until he comes clean, shows some remorse and admits it one day, we'll never know the guy's facing. But what we think is that he would drive around looking for a, a young woman to, to pick up, and when they gave him a brush off, he would get out of the car and hit them on the head. And it's kind of as simple and as stark as that. See, when they get a found guilty, does the officer still try and go back and speak to them to try and get them off to see if there's any, yeah, we, anybody else he's done or any bodies yeah, hidden? But, it, it was tried with both Belfield and with Delroy Grant, but because they both said, no, we didn't we, we didn't do it. So how can we help them? We haven't done it. We're not guilty. We've been wrongly convicted. So you get nothing from them. Nathan Easton, who is the DI, this fabulous bloke who was on the DI, DI on, on Operation Minster on the Dero Grant on the Dero Grant case, he um shortly before he retired, which was sometime after me, he went to see Dero Grant in prison in the hope that he could get him to finally explain and, and, and to talk to him. And Dero just simply said, Fuck off. 
So they said, okay, then. And had to leave it at that. You know. Can't make these people talk. Yeah. Do you ever get any serial killers? There's people who's come forward and they've, they've been lifed off and they've said, like, okay, there's a body there and a body there. Yeah. Have you ever came across that yourself? Not personally, no. But, I mean, I know it has happened on, on, on a number of occasions, yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's... There's a there's a sort of a, a campaign, isn't it, to have a law to say that, that murderers can't be um, paroled unless and until they give up where the where the body's buried. And I kind of think that I mean, it's, it's it's kind of adding insult to injury, isn't it? It's bad enough having a loved one murdered, but then not being able to have a proper funeral, not having that closure, that proper closure. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, you know. I mean, closure is a funny word. I don't often use it really because. As far as I've seen, you know, I've, I've spoken to more recently bereaved people than it's probably good for one individual, but but I have, and they all react in different ways and I always tell them there's no right or wrong way because, God forbid, you or I wouldn't know how it would react until it happened and let's hope it never does. Um, but I think what the bereaved victims do is learn to live with it as opposed to getting closure. I, I think every day they miss their loved one. Every day they probably think about them. But what they do is they learn to have some sort of life and carry on life with that knowledge. Yeah. Um. You never. You can never. You know. They'll. They'll never. They'll never get over it completely because yeah. you can't. I says that in my last interview there. That yeah. time's not a healer. That you no. adapt to the pain. You learn to live yeah, with it. You learn to deal with it and move on with it. But we all yeah. face pain and trauma. That. Yeah. Was Peter Tobin in Glasgow? Do you ever remember that case? I know, I know. He was, yeah, a, yes, he yeah, was a sick yeah. fuck. He had the. Uh, yeah. He was working with the priest, but I think he was. Yeah. Shagging hookers himself. Like I think it was all yeah. fucked up. Like he yeah. had the young Polish girl, and he buried her in the church. In the it? church, yeah, that's right. Yeah, in yeah. Glasgow, but I think he's done a few. Yeah. And uh, I think they're digging up gardens and stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's scary the amount of people that has went missing, and yeah. it could be all connected. Does that constantly play in your mind? Do you try and connect dots even when you're off work and you see things on the news and the newspapers that could be connected to something from 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's um, it's funny how these things can sometimes come to the surface years and years later as well, you know. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are still real genuine mysteries out there, aren't there? You know, there's yeah. still, you know, many of them. And uh, I guess... I don't know. Yeah, this with with the fascination with it, you know, with 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 the kind of this this demand for for true crime stories, um, it won't go away. Nah. What about all the murders you've investigated and speaking to the murderers? Did anybody ever just come clean straight away and put their hands up, or did they all plead their innocence? Yeah, no, one or two did. One or two did put their hands up straight away. I mean. If you get, I don't know what the figures are now, for, for, say for London, 120, 130, maybe 150, I don't know, murders a year. Um, most of those, almost all of those, will be Can unplanned, you? Yeah, will be spontaneous. And <clears throat> Is that correct? I thought it was maybe be gang-related. No, or... well, yeah, but even those, not quite often, <clears throat> the gangs don't go out. Ah, they're not cold-blooded, they're planning that. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're yeah. not like Belfield, who thought, I'm going to go out tonight and get myself a girl, and if I... If she says no, I'm going to kill her. Mm. So I'm going to switch my phone off. I'm going to drive around these streets where I know there's no CCTV, you know, and things like that, this sort of planning. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make sure that I've got gloves and I, I don't leave DNA or fingerprints. Around. So many murders are that spontaneous that the people doing it don't think about CCTV, about their phone signal and communications data, about DNA, about fingerprints, and they do it. And because we as a society and the police still treat murder rightly as something big and the ultimate crime, they put lots of resources into it. So you get a whole team of skilled detectives with pretty much unlimited budgets for scientific work and forensic work. I mean, it is limited, but but generally if you you want something done, you can get it done. And if you throw that at these spontaneous crimes, it's pretty easy to find out who did it. And actually, you can end up arresting somebody and present them with so much evidence they've got no choice to say, yeah, okay, it was me. But it's those little ones at the end, and that tends to be your serial murderers or, or people like Belfield and, and people like Grant, where he wasn't uh, a murderer. They plan what they're doing. They know how the 
they might get caught and they take steps to avoid it. And when you've got that going on, they're the really tough cases. They're the difficult cases, mm. you know. Do you know, that you can kind of tell something's not right with people sometimes, but sometimes these guys, you see a lot of the American ones as well, a lot of films, they come across very well-dressed, very polite, very mm. smart, very manipulative with narcissistic traits kick in. But have you ever sat across with someone and you think, how can you do? How could you do that? Or was there always telltale signs that there's something not right upstairs? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, Dero Grant's a good example of that in some ways because he was, he had a real double life. You see, when we charged Belfield with the murders and we spoke to people who knew him, they sort of said, yeah, we, it was only a matter of time. We always knew he was a wrong and we always knew he was weird. We always knew he was violent, mm. psychopathic, whatever. When we spoke to the people who knew Dero Grant, they told us we must have the wrong man. They said, no, nah, come do it. No, he's, you know, he's the mainstay of the cricket team. He's the bloke who we have a laugh and a joke playing do uh, dominoes with at the pub. Um, he's a devout carer, devoted carer for his disabled wife. Before she was so disabled, he used to go out with her knocking on doors to, to with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, we have a street party in the Colesac here, and he always does the barbecue and puts the music. But, yeah, he's just regular sort of nice guy bloke. You must have the wrong man. And so, and and, and when, you know, if, if, if you watch on the, reading the book or watch on the, the drama last night, it, the, it was absolutely true. I had this conversation with him about cricket. The first time I met him, he'd just been arrested. He'd just been arrested. He'd just given a DNA sample uh, that he knew was going to put him in prison for probably the rest of his life, certainly the, the rest of the good years of his life. And because he was dressed all in white, and because we, you know, we stereotyped a bit, or we, it was it was a joke, really. It was like a joke, sort of an icebreaker, really. When they got introduced to me, and he was very polite, very respectful, bowed his head, shook hands with me, and and uh, but he's dressed all in white because he's been given the plimsolls and and and, and um, jogging bottoms and a sweatshirt because they're taking his clothes on. They're all white, and I thought, West Indian man, his age, he's probably been to cricket, and he'd understand the jokes. So I saw. Are you batting or bowling? He just said it like that. And he seized on it. So I goes, oh, are you into cricket? I said, yeah, I am. He says, I bet you don't still play. I said, I do occasionally, yeah. What, bat and bowl? Oh, no, no, my knees won't let me bowl now. But, you know, I still bat a bit, but not very well. He says, I still bat and bowl. Tell me, what do you think about the England squad going to South Africa for the tour this year? And I'm thinking, you know. I said, well, we could do another fast bowler, but I think, we'd, yeah, I've been saying that to the boys at the pub, you know. And we literally had a conversation that's gone on that long. And I said to somebody, uh, after this, you know, it was a joke, an icebreaker. I didn't expect it to be like one of the, the, the rain incidents in Test Match Special. special. You know, we, we just had this sort of conversation about cricket, and like you might do about football or anything else mm -hmm. in the pub with, with the bloke, you know, that you know. And that was, I now realised that was, that was part of him, wasn't it? That was him. I was seeing the Delroy there that everybody else saw that told us we had the wrong man, that told us he was the nicest bloke in the world, the life and soul of the party, mm -hmm. he couldn't do enough for you. He was being that man there to me. Is that a split personality? I don't know. I'm above my pay grade, James. I don't know. I'm no yes. psychologist. But, but... He definitely had two personalities, yeah. He mm -hmm. had the one that everybody knew and then the one that these old people lying in their beds got to know. Yeah, before that, the, before the, uh, you got called into this court case, like, uh, this, to, to catch him, like, were, you were you just about to retire? Um, no, I had about a year to go. So I was, um, and, and I'd, I didn't have to retire. <clears throat> they, they weren't really... Forcing they, you? wouldn't have forced me out, I suppose. Um, but I kind of wasn't sure what I was going to do, whether I was going to retire or not. And I was still with my own murder team that had done Belfield working at Putney. Um, and, you know, I enjoyed working with them. They were, they were so bloody good. They were, they were a delight to manage and to lead. Um, so I'd have carried on maybe for a bit beyond my, my 30 years. Um, but what happened was that the year before I got, I was asked to go over and look at Minstead, I ended up there. And I was there until my retirement date came up. And, and 
it was I was kind of underused really to a degree because we would we arrested him and charged him. We were doing the papers for court. We didn't weren't even finding any more evidence. Like with Belfield, we carried on investigating that all the time, so it was all circumstantial mm-hmm. evidence. With Grant, we had his DNA. It was it was you know, it was no context yeah. really. Um so all I was doing was supervising the putting together of the case papers for the Crown Prosecution Service and, and uh it got to the day when I could go, and I thought, well, I've had a good run. I've had 30 years. I've got to go sometime. To be honest, if I carry on coming to work next week, I'm coming to work for half pay because I can get half of it and not turn up, you know, the pension. So you kind of weigh things out. And I, I'm sort of 50 years old, just about 51. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, actually, I've got a few good years left still. Who knows? I might be able to do something else. And I didn't know what that might be. I certainly didn't think it would be all this sort of stuff. Uh, I, ended up, stuff. I got a job delivering flowers, you know. <laughs> when I first left the police, the first mm. job I did was delivering flowers for like minimum wage for three florist shops in Surrey. But I loved it. I was like, I would just drive around with this van. Everybody was pleased to see me because I was giving them flowers. Completely stress free, you know? Yeah, sometimes that's all you want. That's like. all I wanted, yeah. So yeah. when you get called up for the one of the biggest sex cases on the run in the UK, like, how long did it take for you to catch them? Uh, well, I went over to look at it to, to do my review. I think it was the end of May in 2009. Um, and I made some suggestions about how they should work and change it around. And they asked me to stay on. And I wasn't given the sort of the reins to it. it, it the, the original SIO was still there. But he, um, I mean, he, terribly sad. He, he, he'd, he'd had a really bad injury uh, to his back some years before in the fight with the prisoner. And he was in a lot of pain. And, and he, Devoted himself so much, really, to to trying to solve Operation Winstead that he, a, a night stalker, whatever you want to call him, um, he he carried on and carried on and carried on when perhaps he really, you know, could and should have been um, given an ill health pension and, and not made to. He he was in a lot of pain sometimes, Simon. Um, and it's to his credit that he wouldn't do that. You know, he was so determined to try and get through this. So he was still the senior investigating officer. And some of the things I'd suggested, he completely went along with and took on board and, and we changed the way it worked a bit. And then he had to go into hospital for a period for another operation on his back. And so I was given the the kind of SIO role. And it was about the time then that um, that I was able to get this surveillance operation going. And, and um, you know, I, I had an amazing amount of help from other people in the Met who were real experts in their field, you know, and and and, and they advised me and, and helped me uh, immeasurably. Um, uh, and, and, yeah, we put this thing together and we did it for 17 days and, and it was in Oct- uh, November, November 13th, 14th, I think, that he was arrested. So, so it's about six months altogether, a bit less than six months. It took months. you six months? Uh, yeah. But, but, so how do you, so you see when you came in, Colin? Yeah. And this man's been at large for... Yeah over 15 years, do you need to look at all the files over that period? How does it work? Yeah, lock myself in an office with do a load you? of dusty files. And there are a few videos I've watched. Again, you've seen the drama because see, some of the interviews of the victims have been recorded on, on video. Yeah, um, it's the only way to do it because if, if, if you don't know something, you know, the last thing I want to do is to come up with a brilliant idea, spend a couple of days writing a report on it, presenting it, and people who know the case better than me say, well, no, that's not true because, you know, I had to know all those because. So, yeah, I didn't have any choice but to get myself up to speed with it. And, and it, took, yeah. it took a while, and it was harrowing. Yeah. So when Delroy done his first um, break-in and uh, sexual assault and stuff, he never done it for a, a longer period after that as well, is that correct? Because they thought maybe he was in prison or yeah. there was a kind of break or is there potentially that he could have been getting in, breaking into houses, raping them, but people weren't too scared to maybe come forward as well? I think either or both, yeah, yeah. The first <clears throat> offence that he left DNA at rape was in 1992. They didn't get DNA from it straight away because DNA wasn't really a thing then. But in 1998, there was another one. And they, they did then get DNA for it. And by that time, they'd been kind of going back over the old exhibits and swabs and things from the old cases. And that's when the match came. Oh, this is the same as one, same man as one in 92. So that was what 
became the series and became Operation Minsid and was given to a specialist team to, to, to investigate. So there was nothing apparently between 92 and 98. And then even during the times that he was active, there were lulls. But the trouble was that because he didn't rape somebody every time, because he didn't indecently assault somebody every time, because he never left his fingerprints anywhere, because he knew that his fingerprints were on file, and one fingerprint he'd have been he'd have been potted. Um, I don't think we can be absolutely sure that there weren't other burglaries, because there have been all sorts of burglaries reported in London during those periods, uh, and in South East London, where we know he he, he only worked. Um, I don't know how many of those sitting there in a dusty box somewhere might be might be Delroy Grant, Grant Grimes, you know. I'm I'm certainly the psychologists and forensic sort of um, profilers and things that, that that I speak to are all very sceptical that he would go quiet for long periods unless there was a reason. So he was living abroad or he was in prison or he was in hospital or something like that. But you know, so people like him don't just stop for a while and then wake up one day and think, Do you know what, I'm gonna start again. You know, it's that's not it's not how their mind works. Did he ever have a girlfriend, wife? Did he? Yeah. Yeah, he had two wives. Did, and he had know, a... did they know about each other? Sorry, yeah, no, he was married. Oh, and married, then married, married again. Married, divorced yeah, yeah. and married again. <clears throat> the first wife um, told us all about, you know, she had a really terrible time with him in terms of domestic violence and abuse and things like that. The second wife, um, she contracted multiple sclerosis and it was the sort of degenerative, progressive version of it she gradually became more and more paralyzed and infirm and disabled. And he was looking after her. He was her carer. He was paid by the local council to be her carer. And apparently did a good job of it during the daytime. And then at night time... He's out raping old women. raping old ladies, yeah. It's fucked up. It's bizarre. And he had a girlfriend we, we came across. Um, and we, 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 we found out this week after he'd been charged that he'd been working as a minicab driver um, in South London. The, um, in the early 2000s. And uh, as a result of that, we found out that one of his passengers um, had sort of started a relationship with him. Do you think that's what he was finding a lot of his victims though, in the cab, maybe dropping them off at home? I think it's entirely possible, yeah. But, I mean, what he was, he was a creature of habit. He had a, he had a particular way that he liked, you know, vast majority of his offences, he'd actually remove a whole pane of glass. He went to houses where they were like 1930s houses, like the one I grew up in. Um, probably a bit like, I think, you know, my dad retired in, I don't know, 80, 84, something like that, 85. And he used his retirement money to get the windows replaced. And the windows you'd get replaced at those times had beading on the outside. If you peeled it off, you could just take the pane of glass out whole. And he knew that. That's how he got into houses, was most of them. Was, was by removing a whole pane of glass. Um, so he had that, and he had, he didn't do social housing, he didn't do flats, he only ever did houses and bungalows. And they were mostly of that sort of vintage, sort of 1930s places. And you know, if you go down to the suburbs of South East London, or suburbs anywhere, and look at estates of these 1930s houses, you can see the ones where old people live. You still can. It's not just the grip, the gut grip rail on the side of the door, but you know, they won't have had won't have had their garden concreted over to park four cars on because their their children have got cars or something like that. Um, the garage might still have the old double doors on. Um, it, it just you know you you could walk down any suburban street like that and old person lives have mm -hmm. was shouting and he knew that he was switched on to that and he was at large for seventeen years. How do you deal with that, Colin? Like going over old footage or interviewing someone in their eighties who's been raped. Like how do they? How does? How do they even deal with that? Like the victims, like a, a lot of victims, I imagine would be dead now. But the vast majority, of them, unfortunately, are. Yeah. How um, heartbreaking is that for an officer to begin in? Yeah, absolutely. And listening to that, absolutely. You know, it, it's just. I mean, yeah. Reading, I, I got it all sort of secondhand. Reading, I, either reading their statements in most cases, or, or or looking at the videos. Um, real live officers have sat down across the table like you and I and spoken to somebody about that. And what 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 comes over to me is this, you know, this the generation that we're talking about here are, are 
the generation that grew up either were children during the Second World War and they grew up with rationing and things in the 50s. And, and they're just a lot more sort of stoical. They're just a lot more reserved and, and quiet and suffering about their, about their problems, I think. And, and that's why I'm sure that there are indecent assault and probably rape victims of his that we don't know about because they just didn't, they reported a burglary but didn't say what happened. Because sometimes it was a considerable time after the event that they'd come forward to us and say, well, actually, do you know what? This is what he did. This is what he did to me. Because people of that generation didn't like talking about intimate stuff like that. They felt shame, some of them. Absolutely no reason for them to, but you can understand, you know, that they did. Um, and that was really part of the motivation of writing the book and 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 making it into into the drama was that what I realised was that these old people never had a voice. There was no Twitter. There was no petitions.org. There was no kind of Facebook groups, Instagram. You know, they didn't have access to report what had happened to them. And we know from talking to journalists at the time, the newspapers were trying to get the youth market, you know, and they, an editor apparently actually said to one journalist, people don't want to read about old ladies being raped over their cornflakes. So there was just no pressure put on. And, and you know, we say it's true, Nathan said it to me, if the victims had been aged 18 to 35, it would have been dealt with by the media and by the police in a very different way. But they were aged 68 to 95. Yeah. Imagine that, living your whole life in your 80s, a man, and, mm. and then your house gets broke down and fucking guys coming in. And yeah. You. What, how many charges did, was he charged well, with? He was 29, eventually. And yeah, he pled he was, not guilty to everyone? He not go to him. Fucking sicko. Oh, it's even better than that. His, his defence was like the comedy defence to be all comedy defences. His defence was that in 1979, when he left his first wife, as he was leaving her, because they were having problems, when they had sex, she saved semen saliva she got a doctor friend to keep it in a freezer at guy's hospital and then in the 90s and 2000s somebody went out with these samples squirting them into old ladies clothing yeah dna is an identification thing yeah it wasn't a thing until the mid 90s you know and it just it's just absolutely implausible defense it was just it was comical if you weren't serious you know um yeah but but he, he, I think the, the, I wanted to ask some questions about how we, how society, how we deal with old people. And there was a, there was a wonderful scene in the drama last night with, with, with Colin, Martin, Clunes, as me, talking to the family liaison officer, and they see some old ladies standing talking in the street, and they're just talking about how they're invisible and how we don't think we're going to get there. We don't think we'll be that. We won't have the Zimmer frame and the bedpan and the, forgetfulness and and because of that it's it's kind of pushed to one side and none of us perhaps I think because I'm getting so close to it myself you've got a few years to go uh, but, <laughs> but, but, but you know it, it's, it's a really serious point mm -hmm. that, that, that these old ladies mostly these victims of Piro Grant were largely invisible and nobody could speak for them how many victims we know officially I think there's 204 offences. I suspect there are hundreds more. Sad, isn't it? Do you think you would have retired if you never caught him? Do you think you'd have kept going an extra year or two years to eventually catch him? Knowing me, myself as I do, 100%, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have given that pathway through this. No. You started putting, was it? Like spy cams everywhere, and how was, did you so, eventually catch well, it? Well, it's just really, um, you know, it was by the very first meeting I ever went to, everything they were talking about was DNA. And I wrote in the margin of my book, What if I didn't have DNA? And that was just a note to myself, being okay, if I'm trying to think of other ways of doing this, everything they're talking about has got DNA. Let's take that away. Pretend we haven't got it. What do we do then? And it was kind of an extension of that. And, and I said, Well, he's actually a burglar. We're, 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 we're saying he's a sexual predator. And he is. But every single fence. Yeah. No. 
Yeah, he's really a sexual predator. We know, we know he's no. That's wrong. I've got this all confused. Sorry, cut, I cut back again. <laughs> um, everyone was treating him because he was a sexual predator, and he was a sexual predator, but he was also a burglar. And that's the important thing for me is, is that every single offence he committed <clears throat> started with a burglary. Some of them, a lot of them, went on to be assaults or rapes. But if there was a burglary there every time. So how do we catch burglars? And I sort of thought back to my time working on divisions and that, and all the way back to Tottenham when I was when I was a, a wee lad. And uh, you know, we had this this guy that was plaguing a tiny part of the division because all the houses they had louver windows. And you could prize them out from the outside and you'd climb in through the window and burgle them. But he was so parochial, he was so restricted to one area that it took about 20 officers that we could get together and he'd sit in cars or borrow people's bedroom windows. And eventually he came along, did one, there's a rest in the house and he's sorted. So what I was to do was to scale that up and do it for a quarter of London. But it takes a lot more than 20 officers to, 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 to do that in a quarter of London. That was... But so what we had to do was we had to get intelligent. I was talking to the crime analyst and saying, okay, let's try and narrow this down to a, a manageable area where we know he likes to offend because the housing stock and because the demographics are right. And um, the analyst did that for us. And, uh, yeah, we had about 70 or 80 people instead. On, on, well, it's still quite a big area to cover. And we just sat there hoping and waiting that he would come and do one in front of our eyes, and he kind of did. Fell into a trap. Did he stay near that area, Colin? Yeah, my, a few miles away, you know, three or four miles away, yeah. I mean, everywhere that he offended was actually reasonably close to, to where he, he lived, yeah. It's mad, that, eh? like, people, how people can go through that. Like, mm -hmm. seeing you catch somebody like that, like, I'm not comparing it, but, look, if I'd imagine for a football player scores a hat-trick or something in his feel good like when yeah. you do that how how good do you feel like <sighs> you brought some fucking sickle like that to justice yeah oh yeah it's, it's, I'm sure it is just like that it's just you know it, 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 it's it's um the the two of the really sort of standout moments of my life when I you know when that jury foreman said guilty for Belfield and when Nathan phoned me up and said I think we've got him, Colin, because we knew once we'd got him, Grant, the trial wasn't an issue because we had DNA and it was going to prove it. It's a bit different. The trial was by no means a foregone conclusion with Belfield. But, um, yeah, it was just, you know, emotional. Um, you feel pride. You, you, you know, I, I, felt, I felt so pleased for members of my team, particularly the Belfield one, because we had people who were so determined. They, they said, no, it's right. I'm not going, I'm, you know, they, they've been qualified for promotion. And they get offered a post. And they say, no, it's all right. I'll wait for a little while. I don't want to be promoted yet. Had somebody put off their wedding, you know, because they didn't want to miss being part of it. And so people have made sacrifices. I mean, it's a wonderful story about the Belfield investigation that when we, before we'd identified him, but when we'd identified his van, we didn't have registration number, we knew the type of van. We kind of thought we had to find it around Twickenham. And I'd go leave home, or leave work rather, say, I don't know, seven o'clock or something like that to go home. And I'd sort of think, I'll just give it an hour around Twickenham if there's anything here, but I'd just see if I could see this van. So I'd pull up there and I'd put the radio on and listen to Five Live and football or something like that, you know, and uh, just sit there and watch for this white van coming past. But the number of times I saw other people of my team in their own cars doing exactly the same thing, and we never waved to each other, and we never even discussed it at work because we'd have all been a bit embarrassed for everyone else to know that we were spending our own time trying to find this bloke. But I wasn't the only one that was yeah. at it. You know, that it's kind of dedication like that that gets to people. And, and um, yeah, they're special people sometimes, these cops. So seeing you caught uh, Leroy mm. was... Do it. Uh, Delroy, so yeah. Delroy. So yeah. see when you caught Delroy, mm. when he was dry, was it was that like a surveillance on him, or was it just you got the that you knew that it could have been him? Was it just pounce on him straight away? No, it, it was. He was. He's, we knew what sort of car he drove from the first night of surveillance because he'd done some offences close by, but not in our area. 
but we knew he must have driven through our area. So we went to the CCTV at a local school, managed to identify what must have been his car. So we knew what colour it was and what sort of car. And that was the road I'd been down with Belfield, and I didn't want to go down again because finding a car in those circumstances is really tough. Um, so we kept the surveillance going, and then one of the officers he'd been into the same um, observation post in this building uh, every night for 17 nights. And as they walked in, he saw this grey Zafira of the type that we knew he drove parked up. So he told everybody else that there's this sort of car that's not been there before and to be aware. And then sometime afterwards, the Delroy, as we now know, came jogging down the street, got in the car and drove off. So what we then did was we had a mobile surveillance team nearby on standby. They were deployed behind the car, but what we needed to do was to try and get him as far away as possible from our area before he was stopped. Because otherwise he might think, if it's the wrong person, he's not arrested, it might otherwise show where we're doing observations. So we can't stop people there, we have to let them go away. So that's what they did. So they followed him for a couple of miles. Um, and he was actually turned off a main road and into another residential area of sort of old residential houses. Um, so part of the thinking at the time was, is he actually looking for somewhere else to break into? But we, in the meantime, we'd gone back around near where his car was parked and actually found a bungalow that he'd broken into there. So it was, by the time he got stopped, it was pretty much... Uh, yeah, it's a pretty good bet that we had the right man there, but of course the DNA confirmed it. Do you think because of his character being the nice guy in the pubs and playing for the cricket team, that it then it's more harder to catch people like that because of it's it's not just a case of luck? Because even his crimes, like he's leaving fingerprints, he's leaving semen, he's leaving mm. all the stuff that you need for a conviction, but yet it took seventeen years yeah, to catch he, him. I mean, he wasn't leaving fingerprints because that would have that would have got him because he had convictions going years back and his yeah. fingerprints were on file. He was very careful not to do that. Um, but DNA, he didn't care about because he knew he, he had nothing to match it to. Um, but I think it, his character and his split personality, yeah, that made it more difficult to catch him because there was quite a bit of publicity, not as much as I think there should have been. But there was quite a bit of local paper and local radio publicity around this case. But because people all knew him as Delroy Life and Soul of the Party, nobody would come forward and say, you know, I think it could be him because he'd done nothing to make people think that it could be him. Contrast that with Belfield, where we have people coming forward to us, including one of his ex-partners, saying, I think your murderer could be this man because, you know, nobody was ever going to say that about Delroy because nobody knew. Mm -hmm. Massive respect for catching those people. That was, like, that's what people don't see. Like, mm -hmm. Can you imagine one of these creeps that, attacking your sister or climbing into your grand or granda's yeah. house like yeah. it's it's mad to think that yeah that happens like the sick shit that you don't really hear about unless you watch those dramas or read your book like how do you feel now that your book's been turned into a successful tv drama and martin clunes is playing yeah your part? Martin, i know it's yeah I, I mean i just roll with it james you know yeah. it's, it's all unexpected you know, I'll tell, I'll tell the story of how it came about because it's, when I when I finished working, I started writing. I always liked writing a bit. And I started writing this book, and I did about twenty thousand words on the Belfield book. And thought, ah, oh, this is nonsense. Nobody's ever going to want to read this, let alone publish it. You know, so I stopped. And and a friend of a friend of a friend, like they do, got Ed Whitmore, who's the scriptwriter who writes Manhunt, got him to talk to me because he was doing something for BBC. It never got made. He wanted uh, some advice on authenticity for it. So he came and saw me in my house, and we just got on, you know? And uh, we, we, we got on really, really well. And, and um, Ed is like a complete walking encyclopedia of murder. I mean, you know, he, and I've, I've done some other work with him for fictional stuff as well. He'll, he'll sort of be discussing something. He'll say, oh, yeah, what about in that case in Tuscany in 1997? What, what, why do you expect me to know about that, Ed? You know, because that's what he does, because it's his job. So he heard I'd started writing this book when we were just talking. I, he said, I want to see it, I want to see it, I want to see it. So I gave him what I'd written. And he read it and he said, Oh, you've got to carry on. It's really good. You've got to carry on. You know, it's great. I said, Oh, yeah, okay. So I took it with a pinch of salt. And unbeknown to me, he was working for Buffalo, for the production company, on something else. And he said, I've, It's a really good story that I think you'd be interested in making into a crime drama, but, you know, we've got to persuade. Uh, Colin, Colin to write it and so I had lunch with him and 
we talked about it and they said, yeah, we, we, wanna, we, want, we want to option your book that you haven't written yet. So I said, oh, okay. Um, and then it was, Ed came and stayed with me uh, for a week and we, we did the first episode of The First Man Hunt. ITV commissioned the whole thing on that. And all of a sudden I had a book to write and a script to help write all over the summer of 2017. It was a bit busy and we got it done. And that's it. That's where, I'm, where I am sort of thing. And then we knew there was, a, you know, I'd always thought, I always saw that the, the Night Stalker story probably was a better story for dramatization in some ways. But because it was so unknown, there's no way we could have done that first. We had to do the Belfield one first because everyone knew about Minnie Dowd, everyone knew about Levi Belfield. Um, and that gave us the sort of the weight or the, the sort of reputation of that one so we could do the second one. And Martin Clunes was, I mean, it's, it's his wife that runs the production company. And at the beginning, she said, I don't know who will get to play you, but you know, it's not, it's not, I'm not doing this for Martin. And it was only when Ed had finished the script and we submitted the scripts and she showed them to Martin. He said, yeah, I want to do that. I want to play that. So that's how he came back. Great guy. Really, really good guy. Great company. Good fun to be with. Yeah. It's yeah. a fascinating life you've led, calling that some madness, some mystery, some darkness, and now you're living the celebrity lifestyle yeah, and people playing your parts. And why list it by yeah. the best, Jays? But yeah, it's just, as I say, <laughs> just, just roll with it. You know, life life throws things at you, take them in your stride. Mm -hmm. Is there any cases you've, you, that there's, the people are still on the run you would have liked to have worked on? I don't think so, really. I don't think so. I've I've got a fascination with the Lucan case, but that's that's been done on telly very well. Listening as well, yeah. So, yeah. But no, not you know. I just, I just say, take life, take things as it comes, and roll with it. Yeah. Do you look at cases though, Colin, and think that you look at? Like, do you know the Bible John case mm -hmm. that was in the Badlands? Mm -hmm. That the, the, the guy was just taking the girls and killing them. Like, yeah. Do you look at those, those old cases and see because there was no DNA there, there's no forensics, so it's obviously no. harder. Then, do you look at it and go and and in your mind you start putting the clues together. There's a lot of these people kind of have the same mind where they kind of think the same as well. Yeah. A lot of these cases that you do, mm. is that correct? Or is everyone totally different? No, I think I think there is a lot. There's, I don't think they're all totally different. I think there are, there are things that, that connect, mm -hmm. yeah, certainly. It's, um, yeah, but no, I, I just, you know, it, it's, um, I, I kind of, I sometimes look sort of jealously at, at you know, think how good, you know, it was the buzz of being in and amongst an investigation fast time that was 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 quite huge really sometimes. And I sometimes miss that. I mean I remember the grief that it also brings, you know, the, and, and the pressure that it brings. And the, so I think yeah, actually I don't miss it that much. It's, yeah. it's, it's easier <clears throat> it's easier telling stories than it is actually doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd imagine that being in that life as being in a life of chaos can be mm. quite exciting. Mm. as well because it's like you're in your own tv series it's like you're in your own real yeah. life fucking that's, 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 that's the remarkable thing for me that's that's the that's the sort of the, the the head exploding point for me is that millions and millions of people are watching these things and tweeting and saying how much they enjoyed it how wonderful it was that was my life mm -hmm. i lived that for real that was my that was my day at work you know that was my day for for years and it kind of gives you a yeah say so it's, it's sort of a head explodes moment I nearly said head fuck moment, but, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, it is, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it is, you yeah, sort yeah. of think, hang on a minute, this was just, that's yeah. just life. That's just what I did, you know? And, and so it's. For over 30 years being a detective and not many people patting you on the shoulder, just your officers, yeah. not really knowing who you are, or what you've done. But then when your story comes to the forefront, you see that you are a soldier, that like mm. some of these things that like no human should see, no human should be yeah. witnessing, and you're there doing what you do, try to catch real yeah. sick people. That That's, yeah. I take my heart off to you for that, Colin. Thank but you. last question, brother, going forward for the future, man, what's the plans? We're getting films out, more books. Um, there's definitely one other book. There's definitely some more documentaries. I start filming um, back in London, filming in October for The Real Man Hunter season two, which is probably going to be the, you know, the, 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 the remaining um, documentary no, sorry, let's put it another way. It's probably going to be the remaining sort of cases that I did that are suitable to be to be sort of made into a documentary and talk yeah. about. Um, and plans for another sort of documentary for the year after about something a bit different. I, I'll um, 
I'll keep them on tenterhooks about because it's not signed up yet. Um, and as in terms of the drama, we would, Ed Whitmore and I would love to do another series of Manhunt. It is possible that we might, but there's a lot of lot of talking and negotiation to be done. You know, it takes a long time to fix it. But if we can, we will because, you know, I've just been bowled over by by people's reaction to it and how much yeah. they like it. And, and, and um, yeah, so we'll see. Um, but if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. I'm, yeah, no doubt it will happen. I think you've got that kind of temple. I'm used to disappointing on a Tottenham Hotspur fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can see, clearly see that way you would be. But um, for anybody that's watching this, maybe want to join the police force, like, what advice would you give for them? Don't do that. <laughs> no, not at all. Hey, listen, you know, I, I would, I would say if you think that you want to serve your community in a way that is exciting and interesting, dispiriting, boring, everything you can think of, um, it's a good job. Yeah. You know, uh, um, and we need people to come forward and be it because, quite frankly, we'd be, we stuffed without them, wouldn't we? Yeah, numbers are going down as well, but I think there's a lot They're of, trying to get them up again yeah, now, but funding yeah. And stuff, yeah, but which yeah. is sad because crime seems to be rising as yeah. well. Not so much as through lockdown, but again, now things seem to have picked I think, up. I think the... The big, the big thing that, that I have a real issue with about it, about recruiting, is this, this, this nonsense to say oh, we, we, we've got to have people with degrees. Everyone's got to have a degree before they can be a police officer. Some of the very best police officers I worked with, had the pleasure to work with or under, were didn't have degrees. Many of them had a background in the armed forces, and they did for didn't yeah. have degrees. They make good coppers. Last question, Colin. What makes a good police officer? Common sense. Knowing right from wrong. Sense of humour. Not it's many I've come across if I had any sense of humour, if I'm honest, Colin. <laughs> but, but listen, <laughs> well, I thoroughly enjoyed your story. A great you. character, great individual, and well done for all the work that you've done over the years. Like, it's unbelievable. And I look forward to seeing more series and more well, books so. out. Like, you've become a... <laughs> I wouldn't say an overnight success because everything that you've done that nobody ever seen that but for what you've done and, and putting yourself at the forefront to see those horrific things to then let other people sleep better at night I take my heart off to you and fair play to you but God bless you Colin and thank you very good much luck for the future. lovely to meet you likewise